So good afternoon, class. Um, the last time we had a meeting, a short meeting, we've already discussed the answers to the questions that I have given you during our prelim exam. So I hope that we have already clarified all the is issues concerning those questions. Should you have any specific concern about the questions that I have given you, nor do you, uh, there are certain clarifications that you want to be addressed, just kindly uh, take them down in, in your notes and we will discuss them during our actual meeting uh, next, uh, I think it's about Friday, okay? So just be ready with your questions should you have any questions about them because now we will, we will move on to the next part of, uh, of the revised penal code which will focus now on the circumstances affecting criminal liability so uh circum there are several circumstances affecting criminal liability we will begin with justifying circumstances uh we will also uh address mitigating circumstances aggravating circumstances and alternative circumstances so what are these circumstances and how do they affect the criminal liability of a person so we will discuss them thoroughly so today I will be discussing exhaustively and extensively the concept of self-defense. Uh, because we always hear that, that uh, you will not be criminally liable if you were just acting in self-defense. But what is really self-defense? Is any type of defense actually uh, a ground for, for justifying a crime? So... Then what does it mean when, when it's a justifying circumstances? And what is the effect on that, especially on the person who committed a crime or who made an omission or a commission of an act punishable by the revised penal code all, or all other uh, parts of criminal laws? So to give you a short preview of what we are going to be discussing in the next following weeks uh, leading to our midterm exam, uh, I will now share with you my presentation. So we will be now discussing Chapter 2 of the Revised Penal Code, which will focus on justifying circumstances and circumstances which exempt from criminal liability. So these are circumstances that are considered by our judges, by our courts, especially in giving out penalties, uh, in giving out penalties and in deciding cases as well under criminal laws. Uh, so uh, let's begin with justifying circumstances. So today we will be discussing so many cases actually, especially in justifying circumstances because I want you to understand uh, the, the concept of self-defense. Because we can easily say that th that was self-defense, but what are the requirements of, of self-defense for it to be considered as a justifying circumstance? So can it actually exempt a person from criminal liability? So we will discuss that. So justifying circumstances are those where the act of a person is said to be in accordance with the law. So that such person is deemed not to have transgressed the law and is free from both criminal and civil liabil liability. So what does it entail? It means that the act of the person, although the act is considered as a commission or omission that could be punishable under uh, criminal laws, such act is actually justified it means that there is a justifying circumstance or it means that that the commission of such act or omission is actually justifiable so there is no civil liability except in paragraph 4 of article 11 where the civil liability is borne by the persons benefited by the act so we will discuss these provisions thoroughly so now what we have to understand is that if a person commits a crime and there are justifying circumstances for the commission of such crime then he cannot be held liable no, no, for such commission or omission because 
the law sees his acts as what? As lawful. Ibig sabihin, legal yung ginawa niya. That's why it's justified. Okay? So, let's first discuss the provisions of Article 11, justifying circumstances. So, under Article 11, the following do not incur any criminal liability. So, what are these um, persons or acts that uh, will not incur any criminal liabilities? Number one, anyone who acts in defense of his person or rights, provided that the following circumstances concur. So, there are requisites. So, actually, number one is a very important concept because this is where we get the, the concept of self-defense. So, no. So, uh, paragraph 1 of Article 11, anyone who acts in defense of this person or rights provided that the following circumstances concur. So, first, unlawful aggression. So, there's unlawful ag aggression. Second, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Third, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. So don't worry because I will be presenting you with some cases so we can actually understand understand the meaning of these terms, which is what is unlawful aggression? What does it mean when we say reasonable necessity? And number three, what does it mean when we say sufficient provocation? Okay? Uh, the second paragraph of Article 11 Anyone who acts in defense of the person or rights of his spouse, ascendants, descendants, or legitimate natural or adopted brothers or sisters or of his relatives by affinity in the same degrees and those by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree, provided that the first and second requisites prescribed in the next preceding circumstance are present, meaning those first, ito, first, unlawful, there should be unlawful aggression. Second, there should also be reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent it. And the, and the further requisite, so there's an additional requisite here. In case the provocation was given by the person attacked, that the one making the defense had no part therein. So this one, this is where we find the concept of def in defense of relatives okay the first one is self-defense you are trying to defend yourself your rights or your property the second one you are trying to defend your relatives so who are these relatives your spouse your ascendants your parents grandparents your descendants your children your grandchildren or legitimate natural or adopted brothers or sisters or of his relatives by affinity in the same degree so number two is about what defense of relatives okay number three anyone who acts in defense of the person or rights of a stranger provided that the first and second requisites mentioned in the first circumstance of this article are present and that the person defending be not induced by revenge, resentment, or other evil motives. So take note of this one, ha? Because this one, the number three paragraph or the third paragraph, now talks about defense or in defense of strangers. So you are trying to help someone who is not your relative, okay? So the first one is about self-defense. The second one is about the defense of rel in defense of relatives. And number three is in, def in defense of strangers. So who is a stranger? Someone who is not, not a relative, okay? Number four, any person who in order to avoid an evil or injury does an act which causes damage to another provided that the following requisites are present. First, that the evil sought to be avoided actually exists. Second, that the injury feared be greater than that done to avoid it. Third, that there be no other practical and less harmful means of preventing it. Okay, so take note of the requisites. So not all types of acts which aims to avoid evil are already justifying the following requisites 
must concur. What does it mean when we say must concur? It must be present no, in the commission or omission of an act. Number five, any person who acts in the fulfillment of a duty or in the lawful exercise of a right or office. No, so this one, I will give you examples of this one. So basically, most of the people who get involved in this on number five are those involved in the safety and security of the public, which of course is the Philippine National Police, the Philippine Army. So if they do an act and uh, an act, no, and in the event that they they cause damage to another, but such act was um done in the fulfillment of duty or in the lawful exercise of a right or an office, then that is also a justifying circumstance. So the, the police officer or the army causing injury to to a to another or, or to another person who but in the process of causing that injury, he was merely fulfilling his duty as a police officer, then he cannot be held liable. That's also a justifying circumstance. So we will discuss that further as we go along, as we try to understand more the concepts on justifying circumstances. Number six, any person who acts in obedience to an order issued by a superior for some lawful purpose. Okay, so I will also give you examples in this one so we can understand better. It's a lot better be if to present you with cases because that's how we that's how we how we imagine, diba? how we imagine and how the laws are actually applied in real life. Yes, we have all these laws. Yes, we have all these provisions. But how do the courts, especially the courts, our uh, municipal trial court, our regional trial court, our, our court of appeals, and of course, ultimately, our Supreme Court, how do they decide these cases if some or, or one or some of these justifying circumstances are actually present okay so today this afternoon i've already presented you all the uh the six justifying circumstances under article 11 but i want you to understand the concept of self-defense so that would be uh our main topic for this afternoon so basically we will focus on paragraph one of article 11 of the revised penal code Anyone who acts in defense of his person or right, provided that the following circumstances concur. First, unlawful aggression. Second, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Third, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. So we will focus our discussion on self-defense. Okay? So, anyone who acts in defense of his person or rights or property. So take note of the, of the specific provisions of paragraph 1. No? In defense of his person, in defense of his right, or in defense of his property. So what is the meaning of that? And why is, why is the state recognizing self-defense as a justifying circumstance? Okay, so we have these following, following reasons for that. So, okay, well, bakit ba? Why is the government recognizing that? Why is the government allowing someone to injure another person? But at the end of the day, that person who causes the injury does not get or does not get or is not uh, penalized, no, for the, for the, for causing such injury because. According according to studies of criminal law, it would be quite impossible for the state in all cases to prevent aggression upon its citizen. No, because at the end of the day, our government, our state cannot protect us for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No, and of course, because of that, and offer protection to the person unjustly attacked because the government cannot be uh, cannot <laughs> cannot be on our defense or cannot secure us for 24 hours a day then we are given the opportunity to defend ourselves our rights and our property 
Okay? On the other hand, it cannot be conceived that a person should succumb to an unlawful aggression without offering any resistance no so the 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 state or the government also recognizes that if a person is hurt or the person is aggrieved by another person then <laughs> he he should not merely succumb to what or to to the aggression without offering any resistance so you can actually defend again at the end of the day because the government recognizes that it cannot protect us for 24 hours a day it allows us to defend ourselves in the event of what of an unlawful aggression the law on self defense embodied in any penal system in the civilized world finds justification in man's natural instinct to protect repel and save his person or rights from impending danger so it is but natural upon us of course right that we cannot <laughs> we cannot uh, sit still when there is an unlawful aggression it is our instinct to protect ourselves okay it is based on that impulse of self-preservation -preserva born to man and part of his nature as a human being. Okay? So, take note of that. No, So, because we, uh, the government and our laws recognizes all these things, diba? So, we have, to be, we have to be very careful as well because not all type of defense is actually a... Uh, or is actually considered as a justifying circumstance. There are certain parameters, there are requisites, okay? And those requisites must all be present. No, when we are we are defending ourselves, it doesn't mean that we can just hurt any person or we can just cause damage to, the, to another person um, with the guise of just protecting yourself, diba? Because at the end of the day, again, the rights of others are likewise protected. So we cannot cause damage or injury uh, just like that because at the end of the day, the person who, 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 who suffers from the damage or the injury is also entitled to the same protection that we are entitled to. So again, the law sets the requirements. So when we say requisites, the law is actually speaking of requirements. So take note of that. Likewise, we have to remember the following important concepts of self-defense. Well entrenched is the rule that where the accused invokes self-defense, it is incumbent upon him to prove by clear and convincing evidence that he indeed acted in self-defense of himself. So he must rely on the strength of his own evidence and not on the weakness of the prosecution. For even if the prosecution evidence is weak, it could not be disbelieved after the accused himself had admitted the, the killing or the commission of the crime. Okay? So what, will, what does this statement mean? No? The burden of proof of self-defense shifts to the accused he must prove the same with clear convincing evidence so going back to our discussions diba? a person shall be presumed innocent unless co uh, contrary is proven or he is proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt but here if the accused invokes self-defense what does it mean when we say invoke Pagsi accused, he decides, no, he decides to to invoke or uh, gamitin ang self defense, no, as an excuse, as a justifying circumstances. The very first thing he must do is what admit to the commission or omission of an act, no. So if if the case is about murder or or homicide. So, if the accused now, he is being charged for homicide. Let's say, just say he is being charged for homicide. So, again, basic is the law is that, basic in the law is that a person 
or an accused shall be presumed innocent until contrary is proved beyond reasonable doubt. So he is considered under the law, he is considered as an innocent person unless the prosecution proves that he is actually guilty of the crime. But then again, what what the problem with when we when we invoke self defense now when we use self defense as an excuse as an accused the accused will now have to admit that he or she killed a person you will have to say yes i killed him but i did not intend to kill him it was just self defense now the accused will have to prove that the self-defense really did occur. So what are the requirements again for self-defense to be a valid justifying circumstance? We go back to the requisites. First, there should be unlawful aggression. Second, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Third, lack of uh, sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. So these three requisites, those three requisites must be present. Because if there was no unlawful aggression, it's not self-defense. Even if there was unlawful aggression, but the, the, the means employed was not reasonable, there is no self-defense. Third, if, if, if the accused himself provoked the victim, then that is also not a defense. That's also not considered a self defense. So, anyway, I will present you some, some, some cases on this one so we can also understand better the concept. So, self defense must be proved with certainty by sufficient, satisfactory, and convincing evidence that includes any vestige of criminal aggression on the part of the person invoking it. No? By raising, by raising the justifying circumstance of self defense, no? The accused must now provide sufficient, satisfactory, and convincing evidence to prove that he did not intend any criminal aggression against the victim. Okay, so those are very important concepts. What are those concepts? Number one. Number one, the requisites, all of the three requisites should be present. Number two, it is now incumbent. What does it mean? It is now upon the accused to prove that the self-defense actually happened. So how do you prove a self-defense? Then the three requisites should be present. Now let's go to the three requisites. Unlawful aggression. So take note, unlawful aggression is an indispensable requisite. No? It is statutory and doctrinal requirement that for the justifying circumstance of self-defense, the presence of unlawful aggression is a condition sine qua non. So what does it mean? It should be present. It should be established. There can be no self-defense, complete or incomplete, unless the victim has committed an unlawful, unlawful aggression against the person defending himself. Okay. So who should make the unlawful aggression in the first place? The, it is the victim who should have done the unlawful aggression. Okay. So let's discuss that with 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 a an example case. So US versus Jose Laurel. So facts on the night of December 26, 1909, while the girl Conception Lat was walking along Okay, going back anyway. On the night of December 26, 1909, while the while the girl Conception Lat no 
was walking along the street on her way from the house of Ezequiel Castillo situated in the Pueblo of Tanawan province of Batangas. Accompanied by several young people, she was approached by Jose Laurel. So take note of the persons here. We have Concepcion Lat, we have Ezequiel Castillo, and we have Jose Laurel. Jose Laurel suddenly kissed her and immediately thereafter ran off in the direction of his house. Pursued by the girl's companions, among whom was the master of the house above mentioned, Ezequiel Castillo, but they did not overtake him. Take him. Okay, take note, ha? There, there was a girl, Conception Lat. There was a boy, Ezequiel Castillo. And there was this another boy who is Jose Laurel. Jose Laurel, while Conception Lat was headed to the house of Ezequiel Castillo, Jose Laurel suddenly kissed Conception. Without her consent, take note of that. Early in the evening of the 28th of December, Jose Laurel went to the parochial building in company with several young people for the purpose of attending an entertainment which was to be held there. So there was a so take note of the take note of the dates. Okay, so 20, December 26, December 28. Now the the kissing happened on December 26, and now we are on December 28. While sitting in front of the road chairs and while the director of the college was delivering a discourse, Jose Laurel was approached by Domingo Panganiban, who told him that Ezequiel Castillo wished to speak with him, to which Laurel replied that he, sh replied that he should wait a while and thereupon Panganiban went away. So um, it seems that Ezequiel Castillo now on December 28 wanted to talk with uh, Jose Laurel. A short time afterwards, he was also approached by Alfredo Yatko, who gave him a similar message. So other, another person, another messenger was sent to, to Jose Laurel. There was a, the same message, and soon after that, Ezequiel Castillo wanted to, to talk to him. No? And soon afterwards, Felipe came up and told him that Ezequiel Castillo was waiting for him on the on the house, no? This being the third summons, so there were already th three persons, three messengers sent to him that Ezequiel Castillo wanted to talk to him. So, there were already three summons uh, addressed to him. He arose and went down to to a certain what uh, to, to a certain what uh, Ezequiel Castillo wanted to say. When they met, Ezequiel asked Laurel why he kissed his sweetheart so apparently conception lat and ezekiel castillo were in a relationship so he was angry with his uh, jose Ra laurel for kissing uh his, his girlfriend and on on laurel's replying that he had done so because she was very fickle and prodigal about her use of the word Yes, on all occasions. Ezekiel said to him that he ought not to act that way and immediately struck him with a blow on the head with a cane or a club. So what happened now? Jose Laurel, um, Jose Laurel told the boyfriend, Ezekiel, Ezekiel Castillo, that uh, Conception Lat was only ano, nagpapakipot. Oh. So, because of that, Ezequiel Castillo actually struck him no, uh, with a club or a cane, which assault made Laurel dizzy and caused him to fall to the ground. So, because he was hit on the head, Jose Laurel fell on the ground in a sitting posture and that as Laurel feared that his aggressor would continue to assault him, he took hold of the pocket knife which he was carrying in his pocket and therewith, therewith stabbed Ezekiel. So, would you imagine now what was happening? He got hit by a cane. So, Jose Laurel, Jose Laurel fell down and he was fearing that uh, uh, Ezekiel Castillo would hit him once again with a cane. <laughs> he decided to get his pocket knife. He had a pocket knife with him and then he stabbed Ezekiel. Among the wounds inflicted on Ezekiel, the wound in the left side of his breast was the most serious. So there were several wounds. There were several wounds actually uh, sustained by Ezekiel. But it was on his left breast. 
he was he was stabbed on the on the on the chest part was the most serious on account of its having fully penetrated the lung. So what happened is that the pocket knife. So there were se there were several stab wounds, but then the the most crucial part was the one on his breast part, left breast, because it penetrated his lungs and caused him to spit blood. So meron nang dugo. He would have died had it not been for the timely medical aid rendered to him. So. So how did the Supreme Court decide this case? The defensive act executed by Jose Laurel was attended by the three requisites of illegal aggression on the part of Ezequiel Salcedo. So the victim here, take note, is Ezequiel Salcedo. Ezequiel, sorry, Ezequiel Castillo. There being lack of prov sufficient provocation on the part of Laurel, who did not provoke the occurrence complained of, nor did the, he direct that Ezequiel Castillo be invited to come down from the parochial and arrange the interview in which Castillo alone was interested. And finally, because Laurel, in defending himself with pocket knife against the assault made upon him with a cane, which may also be considered as a deadly weapon, employed reasonable means to prevent or repel the same. So let's go back to our requisites, okay? So going back to our requisites, we now examine whether the requisites for what? Whether the requisites for a valid justifying circumstances are present. Number one, was there unlawful aggression? Yes, there was unlawful aggression on the part of Ezequiel Castillo, right? Because he hit Jose Laurel with a what? With a, a club or a cane on his head. Number two, reasonable necessity. Was it reasonable and necessary? Or the means employed by Jose Laurel, was it reasonable or necessary? So take note, uh, it was also considered as reasonable and necessary on the part of Jose Laurel to defend himself. And third, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. Who? So who was defending himself here? It was actually Jose Laurel. So he did not provoke Ezequiel Salcedo because sorry Ezequiel Castillo because Ezequiel Castillo was actually the person who what who initiated what the aggression he first hit Jose Jose Laurel and now Jose Laurel had no other choice but just to defend himself so that those are the requisites we see that in US versus Jose Laurel so next, another 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 case. Teodoro Sabio was squatting with a friend, Irving Hurilia in a plaza. So take note of what the, this is a separate case, okay? So this is no longer uh, connected with the case of US versus Laurel. So this is people versus Sabio. Okay. This defines what unlawful aggression means. Teodoro Sabio was squatting with a friend, Irving Horilla, in a plaza. Okay? Romeo Bacub Bacobo and two others, Ruben and Leonardo Garcia, approached them. So there are five persons here. All of them were close and old friends. So they are friends, close friends. Romeo Bacub Bacobo then asked Sabio where he spent the Holy Week. At the same time, he gave Sabio a foot kick greeting. So sometimes now with our friends, we would do that while they are squatting. We would kick just a little, okay? So it was in the form of a, a joke uh, or banter. So touch and, and the foot kick a greeting touched Sabio's foot with his own uh, left foot. Sabio thereupon stood up and dealt. Uh, Romeo Bacobo a fist blow so he punched Bacobo for for giving me a foot kick greet for giving him a foot kick greeting so it was um Teodoro Sabio was sitting down he was greeted by Ro Romeo Bacobo he was kicked just for just a very you know very slight kick not actually a strong kick so Romeo Bacobo got up 
No? And he what? He punched. Oh, sorry. Yun. He punched Sab. Sorry. No. Ro, uh, Sabio got up and he immediately he punched uh, Romeo Bacobo for kicking him on the foot. So Sabio thereupon stood up and dealt Romeo Bacobo a fist blow, inflicting upon him a lacerated wound three, three and a quarters inch long. So because of that, uh, Bacobo here suffered from a lacerated wound at the upper lid of his left eye. So somewhere around here, no, around an inch long. So then he... It took him from uh, 9 to 12 days to heal and prevent Romeo Bacobo from working during said period as employee of Victorious Milling Co. Okay, so what was the decision here? Was the playful kick or the foot kick greeting considered as a an unlawful aggression? According to the to the Supreme Court, a playful kick at the foot by way of greeting between friends may be a practical joke. So it's it was just a form of banter. It was just a form of a joke between them, and may and may not and may even hurt just a little. Okay, but it is not a serious or real attack on a person's safety. It may be a mere slight provocation so it's not considered a mere kick a gentle kick on the foot is not unlawful aggression which would what result to the person defending himself to have a valid self-defense so uh theodoro sabio sabio by hitting uh romeo bacobo on his left left eye did not was not considered to have performed a self defense because in the first place uh the playful kick given to him by Romeo Bacobo does not tantamount to what unlawful aggression okay so next there are certain considerations as well no nature character location and extent of wound of the accused allegedly inflicted by the injured party may belie the claim of self defense so now not all type again uh, of defense is self defense why first let's look at the location and the number of of serious wounds so Number one, the location, number, and seriousness of the stab wounds inflicted in the victim belie the claim of self-defense. Ginpapamuwa. Karag sa yung buwa lang itong nagsiself-defense niya. Kaya imagine, one of the victims alone sustained 21 wounds. So how can it be self-defense when there are 21 wounds? If there are 21 wounds, then... The the intent here would be is to kill, diba? Imagine you would you would raise the defense of self defense, but then you would inflict twenty one wounds to a person. It's no longer self defense. The gravity of the wounds suffered by for suffered by by the victim would 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 belie no gimpapa muwa niya or binuwa la and self defense, no. Number two, improbability of the deceased being the aggressor belies the claim of self-defense. So it was unlikely that a sexagenarian would have gone to the extent of assaulting the 24-year-old accused who was armed with a gun and a bolo just because the latter refused to give him a pig. So take note of this. This is also very important. Appar Apparently, our co courts also consider the age between the accused and the victim so here the accused is raising the defense of self-defense so he wants the court to, to to recognize that he was just acting in self-defense but they note the accused here was only what 24 years old was armed with a gun and a bolo and here the victim is a sexagenarian of old age very old age so imagine a 24 year old defending himself with a gun and a bolo against a person who is actually very very old no so um there's a presumption here that it was very improbable no? uh, of the deceased to have aggressed or to have had unlawful aggression against the accused here 
Okay? So, number three, when the aggressor flees, unlawful aggression no longer exists. So, take note of this. Kay mga lalaki, dida, ha? Kay mahilig ka mo. Nadiri na nga ni, naatras na nga ni, iyo pa hahabulon. Take note of this. This is a very important case. When unlawful aggression, which is begun, no longer exists because the aggressor runs away, the one making a defense has no more right to kill or even to wound the former aggressor. So take note of that. If the aggressor here, who is the aggressor? The victim. He was the initial aggressor here. If the aggressor already ran away, no? Umatras na hiya. The one aggressed, no? Here, no longer has the right to hurt or kill him. Because the unlawful aggression has already stopped. Okay, umatras na nga ni, tas habulon pa niyo itong atawo. <laughs> Bisan pa hiyan nagtikang-tikang hansamok, pero umatras naman hiya, dumalagan na. Kung habulon pa niyo, ngan iyo pasakitan, iyo kastiguhon, iyo patayon, you can still be held liable for physical injuries, less, ser less or serious physical in injuries. Okay? Or even homicide. And depending on the number of... of of uh, injuries or wounds inflicted, pwede gihapon niya murder. Okay? So, matras na nga ni Tawo. Do not run after them. Just let them be. Where do you go? You go to the police. Let the police capture him. Do not take the law into your hands. Okay? Next. Reasonable necessity of the means employed. Now take note. Now take note. Okay, this is also a very important requisite. We have three requisites. Unlawful aggression, reasonable necessity of the means employed, and what? Lack of sufficient provocation on the person defending him, sure, himself. So, now let's go to the second requisite. Reasonable necessity of the means employed. What does it mean when we say reasonable necessity? This second requisite of defense presupposes the existence of unlawful aggression. So, it was already established that there was unlawful aggression, aggression which is either imminent or actual. Hence, in stating the second requisite, two, uh, uh, two phrases are used namely to prevent when we are attacked, the danger to our life or limb is either imminent or actual. In making a defense, we prevent the aggression that places us in imminent danger or repel the aggression that places us in actual danger. A threat to inflict real injury places us in imminent danger. An actual physical assault places us in actual danger. Okay, so how do we determine whether it was necessary for the person to make such, um, such uh, or to do such means, means nga ni method, di ba? To do such act. Number one, we have to establish the necessity of the course of action. Number one, you have to consider the place and occasion of the assault considered. Okay, for example, there was unlawful aggression, but it was in a crowded place wherein uh, the one uh, the one who was um or the accused here could have asked the help from other persons to repel the unlawful aggression huh? so if it was if if the aggression was actually done in a public place then there was no there, there uh when you use a shotgun to kill a person and there were other persons actually around to which you could have asked help for from and you could not have had killed that person kung yun buligan ka la, di ba? For example, there was, uh, you suffer, um, um, the victim here performed a lawful aggression. For example, a woman, let's say a woman here, um, ginkahaman hiya, no? Kahaman na niya, kanya backside, no? So, there were police officers, the, 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 the act was committed, in the midst of a public place and there were police officers. But instead of asking for help from the police officers, the woman immediately stabbed the aggressor here in the neck, which caused the instantaneous death of the 
of the of the victim here the aggressor becomes the victim okay so that kind of that kind of means employed the method that she used to to repel the aggression is actually not reasonable or necessary because number one she could have asked the help of the police officers right and number two there was no need to kill the person for yet yeah, because it was conduct it was the the aggression was made in a public place so there were so many people who could have helped her and she could not have taken the law into her hands by simply killing killing the victim here who performed the aggression okay so it would also be considered the the occasion of the assault is assault is also considered number two the darkness of the night and the surprise which characterized the assault is also considered the nature and quality of the weapon so for example if you were attacked <laughs> with a for example you were attacked by a frying pan so lutuan no you were hit in the head by a with a frying pan and then you retaliated with a shotgun immediately killing the person who hit you in the head with a frying pan the inequality between the weapons used between the two will also be considered because if you get hit by a frying pan frying pan is not considered as a deadly weapon but then the shotgun is <laughs> is a heavy weapon <laughs> right so the the inequality between the weapons used and it will also be considered the inequality between the weapons will also be considered uh in determining uh whether uh the circumstances warrant a justifying cause okay the physic physical condition character and size so as i mentioned earlier in in a case before if if the victim is also already a sex uh sex sad what uh sex Sa what <laughs> sorry so sectagenarian okay already very old of age then then there's no need to use such deadly weapons to kill him right because a a a young male can actually easily overpower a person he was already old okay so there was no reason actually to employ such what uh means um such cruel <laughs> means against such person and other circumstances considered okay take note of those provisions whether or not the means employed is reasonable will depend upon the nature and the quality of the weapons used by the aggressor his physical condition character size and other circumstances and those of the person defending himself and also the place and occasion of the assault perfect equality between the weapons used by the one defending himself and that of the aggressor is not acquired so okay let's also clarify the aggressor here becomes the victim and the one defending himself invoking self-defense becomes the accused in the case okay so let's not get uh, no, let's not get uh, confused with that so the victim is the what the initial aggressor the victim is the one who started the aggression and the and the accused here in a case is the one actually who suffered from the aggression and is defending himself that is why now he is invoking self defense okay so because the person assaulted does not have sufficient tranquility of mind to think to calculate and to choose which weapon to use so it uh, all the weapons are also considered but it doesn't necessarily mean that there should be a perfect equality between between the weapons that you have used so long as there is imminent danger of life or of the exercise of right and the loss of property then there's there could be a uh, reasonable necessity of the means employed reasonable necessity of the means employed does not imply material commensurable commensurability between the means of attack and defense what the law requires is rational equivalence in the consideration of which will enter as principal factors uh, it, uh the emergency the imminent danger to which the person attacked is exposed okay so the urgency of the circumstances and the instinct more than reason that moves or impels the defense and the prop proportionate thereof does not depend 
upon the harm done but rests upon the imminent danger of such injury. So, for example, the person who was uh, uh, kicked, <laughs> uh, diba, lightly kicked, eh, diya, yeah, uh, bakobo, foot kicking, greet, foot kick greeting, no? It was not aggression. So, the, the means employed by punching him directly on his upper left eye is not a reasonable and necessary method or means employed. Okay? Now, let's go to lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the accused. So, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. So, who is defending himself now? It's the accused because he is the one raising the the. Uh, justifying circumstance of self-defense. When the person defending himself from the attack by another gave sufficient provocation, so kung hiya nagtikang-tikang, an accused din nagtikang-tikang, then no, it cannot be considered as self-defense kay in the first place, so, Going back, it cannot if the if the accused himself started the provocation and so gave sufficient provocation, then he it this cannot be considered as a what as a self defense because in the very first place he was the one who started everything. Okay, hence to be entitled to the benefit of the justifying circumstance of self defense, the one defending himself must not have given cause for the aggression by his unjust conduct or by inciting or provoking the assailant. So, at the end of the day, if it was the accused here or the one defending himself started everything, <laughs> began the quarrel, then that is already, there is already sufficient provocation. In justifying circumstances, what is the requisite lack of sufficient provocation? It means there should have been no sufficient provocation on the part of the accused. Okay, so going back in our discussion on the requisites. So thus when A shot B to death because B was running amok and with a dagger was rushing towards A, manifestly intending to stab A, there was no provocation whatsoever on the part of A. The third requisite of self-defense is present. So, for example, if 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 A shot B to death because B was running amok, so din he nagwawala he B. So, he A, gin shot niya he B, which caused the death of B. But because B was actually, uh, A had to shoot B because he B was running towards A and <laughs> uh, was intending to stab A. So, again, there's also self-defense here. There was no uh, sufficient provocation on the part of, of A. So, anyway, let's go to this one. This illustrative case, this will be our last last uh, case for this afternoon. Illustrative case, People versus Dolfo. A was an electrician while B was his assistant. Okay, A called B to him, who instead of approaching, he asked him, why are you calling him? So A was the electrician while B was the assistant. So A, the boss, called him, but B, instead of going back, going to him, just decided to say, why are you calling me? A considered the retort or the response as a provocative answer and suddenly threw a 4 by 2 inches piece of wood at B. So, <laughs> the response of B, uh, medyo ano what, um, nasaling and pride ni A, him being the lead technician and B being the assistant. Bagan, what I respect to ha iya pagkita, no? So, what he did is that he decided to throw a 4 by 2 inches of wood at B. B retaliated by throwing at A the same piece of wood. So, ginlabay balik na, ginlabay ni A, he B, he B liwat, ginlabay balik ni, uh, ginlabay balik niya, he A. A picked up the piece of wood, approached B and started to beat him with a piece of wood. So, B, also, he A now, the, the electrician, the head electrician, started to beat uh, B with a piece of wood. B defended himself with a screwdriver and, and inflicted a mortal wound on A. What is a mortal wound? It's a wound that killed A. Okay? Namatay did he A. So, the question is, was there sufficient provocation on the part of B when he retorted, why are you calling me? So, is that statement 
Why are you calling me? Is that already sufficient provocation? B, number two, was there a reasonable necessity in using the screwdriver to repel the attack? The first question, was there sufficient provocation? B's answer, why are you calling me when summoned by A might have mortified and annoyed the latter, but it was not sufficient provocation. It is not sufficient. It's not considered provocation. Pag yaka nga, kaya nang bagin tatawag mo ako. No, it might have, it might have, what? Um, uh, the provocation must be sufficient or proportionate to the act committed and adequate to arouse one to its commission. So, pwede man hiya physically gin harm, di ba? Gin, gin reply man laliwat hiya. Mainit siguro ang ulo ni A as siya uh, medyo, uh, he felt disrespected. Being the lead uh, electrician, he felt disrespected. That's why he decided to to, to what? To, <laughs> to throw the wood at B. It is not sufficient that the provocative act be unreasonable or annoying. So, diri man, kina, diri man ito enough nga na annoy ka la hangin niya kan. A small question of self-pride. No? It imo pride laan na saling. No, that's not sufficient provocation for you to hurt someone. No, ito nga yung nag-istorya, nagyaka nila ka mo. <laughs> no, it's no reason to hurt another person. It, it cannot be a ground for self-defense. Okay, so take note of that. So, I will discuss the battered woman syndrome during our uh, meeting on Friday. So, I hope that you will also prepare for that. So, I hope that you will watch the video presentation. We will be having a quiz right after. So, take no I hope that you have taken down the notes uh, all throughout the discussion. So, should you have any questions, just kindly take them down so that I will respond to them during our class on Friday. So, I hope you learned something today. Take note of the requisites of what? Of uh, justifying circumstance on self-defense. Number one, there be unlawful aggression on the part of the victim. Number two, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the unlawful aggression. Number three, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. So those are the basic requisites. So what I want you to do now, okay, is to answer the questions. Just input in our quiz the three the three requisites of what self-defense under justifying circumstances i will send you um a doc uh google forms a little later okay so anyway that's it for today good afternoon to everyone i hope you learned something keep safe and stay healthy wherever you are and i'll see you on friday so good afternoon and take care